Our first keynote presentation of the day is sponsored by Busey Bank, titled Managing Phosphorus and Carbon in Illinois Soybean Production Systems. To support soybean growers' profitability while contributing to nutrient loss reduction goals, trade-offs among yield and environmental outcomes specific to soybean production and sensitive to cropping system context must be quantified. In Illinois and the greater north central region, soybeans are uniquely situated to contribute to nutrient loss reduction and capitalizing on proposed carbon crediting programs. To this end, ISA-funded research results will be reviewed on the four R's of phosphorus management, which stands to deliver nitrogen loss reduction benefits, as well as a newly initiated project to provide benchmarks on interrelated soil, water, and climate quality outcomes of soybean production. Dr. Andrew Margadant is our first keynote speaker this morning, soil scientist and faculty member at U of I here in uh, Urbana-Champaign. After his PhD research on soil fertility in East Africa, he joined the Illinois agricultural scene in 2017, where he leads a research team that evaluates nutrient biogeochemistry in our state and the greater north central U.S. region. That's the first time I've seen the word biogeochemistry. That's very impressive. Dr. Bargadot's research focuses in particular on phosphorus management, soil health, and carbon crediting with the goal of supporting efficient use of nutrients for crop productivity that support environmental quality. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Dr. Andrew Margana. Thanks to Les for the introduction, and glad that you learned the biogeochemistry term, which is really a fancy way of saying how nutrients move through soil, air, and water, in my opinion. So first, I want to thank ISA for having me here and for giving my lab the chance to share with all of you some updates on research funded by the Chekhov program. So today, we want to talk and share with you the results of two different projects. The first ended just last season. The results are almost finalized, and that's on how the choice of phosphorus fertilizer timing and the other of the four R's can help impact nutrient loss reductions. And the second is a preview of a new project that we have that looks at benchmarking different indicators of sustainability. And so here we have in mind things like soil health, water quality, as per usual, and the new wild west of carbon credit markets. And so I want to share with you some ideas, some thoughts, on what's going on with carbon credits and how soybeans fit into that story. So with that, uh, these are the two projects that were funded by the Chekhov program. We appreciate the support. It's through this program that we can do research that I'd like to argue today is cutting edge and first of a kind in the world. Okay, and of course it takes a village to do any kind of a field-based project. And these are the five major members of my group that are specifically focused on the projects that you're about to hear today. Two of whom are sitting over there on my right-hand side. So um, I want to begin with some context here on soybeans in the state of Illinois. Um, any guesses as to when the first documented growth or cultivation of soybeans was for our state year-wise? I can't really hear the whispers, but if you don't mind shouting out, that would be appreciated. 1900, it's a bold guess, I like it. Others, 1920, okay, so, so the 20th century is what I'm hearing. So it seems like it was uh, 1851 in Alton, which is roughly just north of uh, St. Louis. Um, and this was a documented case where Japanese sailors quarantined in San Francisco Bay met up with a Illinois farm boy who was out in San Francisco who traded soybeans with them. He came back home and planted them. So this is a plaque that commemorates the first known cultivation at scale in the U.S., and it happened to be in our state. There were previous entries in Georgia and Massachusetts, where I'm from, uh, but those didn't really take off for obvious reasons. Those are not known for soybean production today. So then, uh, well, I just kind of gave it away. I was going to ask uh, what the first use of soybean was, and I clicked too soon. It was for hay as fodder. It was not really being grown as a grain crop. 
And that really came about by the 1920s. Uh, so prior to that, we still used draft power. And so things like horses and mules needed a source of fodder and oats were a major source of that, same with clover. And then we switched to soybean gradually as a fodder source. And there's all these old documents by the U of I uh, uh, proclaiming the, the quality of uh, soybean as a good fodder material. Okay, uh, these are the Mara plots. They're about north of us, less than a mile. In, in case you don't know, these are the second oldest continuous ag experiment uh, plots in the entire world. The, the British have us beat by about four decades, 1843. And uh, in the middle there is the soybean phase of the crop rotations being tested. But obviously, in, in 1876, soybeans weren't being grown here. So any guesses as to when soybean was introduced into the Morrow plots as an official crop rotation treatment? Come on, folks. My students have more animation than this. I know that there's some thoughts out there. 1940, thank you, sir. Um, a little bit after that, actually. The Mara plots relate to the game. 1967 was when we officially switched what was a corn oat rotation in that second plot there into corn soybean. And the third plot, as you can see, is still in oats, and that's a corn oat alfalfa. It used to be corn oat clover. Again, forage. So I bring this up because uh, my point here is that we weren't really growing soybean at scale until about the 1930s or 40s. Uh, the Mara plots were, were kind of late to reflect that. And this matters because soybeans, when they first entered the state as a forage crop, then as a grain crop, they didn't have the best reputation from soil conservationists. So uh, soybeans were scorned by a lot of extension agents as not a great choice for soil conservation for the reason that they had less residue and thus surface soil coverage compared to other crops like oats or a two-year alfalfa or clover crop rotation. <clears throat> Sorry crop uh, rotation. So um, basically people were concerned about greater erosion when soybeans were making an entry into the state in the early 1900s. And to give you some data on this, if we take the uh, statewide average yields from last year and we assume that for every uh, 40 bushels of corn, there's roughly one ton of residue that remains. And it's about uh, one ton of residue for 30 bushels of soybean taking the average yield from last year, which were 215 bushel corn, that's a state record, and 64 bushel for soybean, it's roughly two and a half times more residue left on the surface following corn than soybean. So this is the basis for why conservationists were a bit alarmed initially that soybean was being uh, substituted for things like oats or alfalfa. And there's also a second uh, point to this, is that there, there's a lower C to N ratio of the soybean residues, which means that they will decompose quicker. So you've got less material left on the surface, and it's not going to last as long. So there's less shielding of the soil, thus the concern that soybeans might be facilitating greater erosion. And then adding to this is that there's less carbon into the system, and as a result, we are likely to less immobilize nitrogen. Lowell Gentry's done some good work on this in tile drain systems. This is his data shown here on the bottom right. Basically following corn, which is the left-hand panel, and following soybean, which is the right hand, uh, during the subsequent winter into early spring months, we see in some cases higher tile nitrate concentrations, and in this example, four times higher nitrate load losses after soybean than after corn. That might seem counterintuitive because we know that corn receives a lot more N than soybean, a lot more, right? Uh, but this goes to show that, one, we can lose nitrate through tiles not because of fertilizer, a message that I think needs to get out there more. This is a natural loss of nitrogen from organic matter. But second, it, it points out that the lower carbon input of the soybean residues enables a window where we might be vulnerable to losing our natural capital of soil organic matter-based nitrogen. So these are two problems with soybean that were identified, first one early on, the second one by Lowell more recently. But I think there's also opportunities here. So what I'm trying to argue is that soybeans are, unlike corn, able to serve as a lever to introduce practices that can markedly draw down on nutrient losses. And I'm going to talk to you about ways that we've shown that this can happen with our first project and then ways in which we think it could happen with our second project.
So um, first, well, basically, uh, soybeans can take or deal with certain practices that we know are beneficial for soil conservation and water quality more easily than corn. There's a lower risk yield, uh, sorry, there's a lower risk of a corn yield drag if we do things like no-till or cover cropping in front of soybean compared to corn. So uh, because of that, there's a potential co-associated benefit of soil health. The same practices that we know improve soil quality or soil conservation uh, can also double for soil health improvement and even carbon credits, which is a term that we hear more and more about today. So here are just two examples of the ones that we will be testing and two examples where I think soybean shines. It's better able to deal with these practices and not have that yield drag risk compared to corn. Um, and then there's maybe even a third way to think about soybeans leading the way to enable decreases in nutrient losses. So imagine that you've got a typical corn soybean crop rotation as shown here. Um, if we double crop the wheat with the soybean as uh, the Lusses family did in Kansas, but we do it here, then we have greater coverage of the ground. And so this is effectively a, a cover crop. As we all know, um, it's not really a cover crop because we're going to harvest it, but the concept is that you have roots in the ground for soil health, you've got coverage for conservation benefits. And then, so if we do some simple math here, uh, compared to the typical corn soybean crop rotation, uh, in that case, we've got coverage about roughly 60% of the months over two years. Compare that with double cropping wheat soybeans, then we've got coverage for about 80%. And if we further introduce a cover crop, we're looking at near complete coverage of soil year round. So this is perhaps the ideal for soil health and soil conservation. Obviously, this is going to present trade-offs, agronomically speaking, and I think those are quite important to consider. So a fourth potential way that soybeans might lead the way in terms of uh, reducing nutrient losses would be the choice of phosphorus. And this might seem counterintuitive. How can soybean phosphorus management help decrease nitrate losses? Well, it comes down to the major sources of phosphorus in our state. And in much of the uh, country are ammonium phosphates, which means that you have to add some nitrogen when you're adding phosphorus. Soybeans don't really need that nitrogen. And if we're doing fall applied N, or sorry, fall applied P as ammonium phosphates, there's going to be a potential risk of losing that ammonium which will uh, transform to nitrate in the ensuing winter to spring months. So to give you some back of the envelope examples of why this might matter and how soybeans can help with this, um, if you consider the typical scenario where roughly half of our acres receive 200 pounds of DAP per acre, this is gonna add up to 60% uh, more nitrogen being applied than the amount of N reductions we have to target as a state to meet the EPA milestones by 2045. So this is simply a comparison of magnitudes. I'm not saying that we would stop all application of fall ammonium phosphates, but the amount of N going on with MAP and DAP in the fall or the spring is quite large. So if we can shift the P source to say triple superphosphate, I know that's hard to get around here, uh, that would be one example of how soybeans wouldn't really be bothered. Unlike corn, there's not really a free end credit there that they can capitalize on, but it would have tremendous disproportionate, in a good way, benefits for water quality. So that brings me to, a, to the summary of our first two-year project that was funded by ISA checkoff funds. This was led by PhD, by PhD student Yuhei Nakayama sitting there. He's got a poster with more details. And basically in this two-year project, we sought to understand how much could you reduce nitrate leaching by changing the P source as well as timing and, uh, and placement going in front of soybean. So for this, we had two sites, central and north. This captures the major soil types of the state, the black mollusols of central north. Um, and then the alpha cells of the south, so central and south sites. And we looked at uh, two basic rates of phosphorus, basically the maintenance rate based on the estimated yield target, and then three-fourths of the maintenance. And then we looked at other things like uh, whether we do this as a fall or spring application, broadcast, or banding. So looking at placement, timing, and sources of the four R's. And we looked at yields, obviously, and then leaching of P and nitrogen o over two years. I want to focus on, in this next slide, on just the nitrate nitrogen leaching across these treatments. 
So what we found basically shown here first for Urbana and Champaign County across the uh, different pea sources on the x-axis there, including the nun, that snow pea fertilizer, that the amount of nitrate and leached pounds per acre on the y-axis on average, which is the middle line of those boxes, that's the average value, and then you've got the upper and lower bounds that we see as expected, as hypothesized, there's higher nitrate and leaching when we apply P as MAP or DAP compared to triple super or slow release ammonium phosphates like struvite, which has magnesium and makes it less soluble. So note that the struvite, the TSP there are pretty much on par shown there as the dotted red line with the average nitrate leaching when there's no P being added. That's the control. And then you've got DAP and MAP at the two rates having a higher leaching load of nitrate N. Now these numbers seem quite high and that shows you that, the, that there's a bigger effect of background nitrate losses than what we're losing from our ammonium phosphate. So without adding any amount of MAP or DAP, we're still losing in some places up to 80 pounds of N in this winter season, it was quite warm. So this is also important because if we have cover crops in that period that can drastically cut down on our natural or our background and leaching. That was in the central state site. This is down south. Alpha sols have got fragipans. Leaching is less of an issue, but it does happen. And then it goes horizontally above the water table perched on the fragipan. So we still can lose by subsurface processes nitrate down south. And so here we see that there's a lot more uh, that there's a lot more variability in terms of nitrate and loads being lost, and we see less of a strong signal of MAP and DAP, but it's still on average higher nitrate and leaching. So this might seem obvious. Our goal here was just to corroborate and confirm this hypothesis that, yeah, if you switch uh, P sources to having a nitrogen-free P source, you're going to avoid the end losses in front of soybean. So this is one example by which we're trying to determine how soybeans can, quote, lead the way for helping reduce uh, nutrient loss reductions. Yields were the same and the P export values were the same uh, across our two sites. In terms of yields overall, not surprisingly, TSP is just fine as a P source. There are some reports that TSP, by virtue of its trace sulfur content, can increase soybean yields in some soil types. We did not see that even in the southern site. Um, the rates gave the same yield, I think, because we were looking at a maintenance rate that was overestimated. So the handbook now has updated values that we weren't quite using. So I think we're going to have more accuracy in, in uh, future years. And in our two years, we found no effect of when you apply P or how you apply it, banding or broadcast, when it came to yields. But we saw a, a obvious benefit for nitrate and, uh, sorry, we saw a benefit for reducing end losses by switching from fall to spring or from pea source. Some other insights from this ISA work is that first baseline or background and leaching, um, even after soybean can be quite high. And this speaks to the importance of quantifying this background loss. It also varies by time and space. Within a couple meters, we saw tenfold differences in nitrate leaching loads. Second is that we get, as a result of number one, in the higher organic matter soils of the black and flat region of the state, there's higher leaching of N as well as phosphorus compared to down south. But despite this, there's still some benefits to P source selection and then the timing fall versus spring of the P source. And finally, uh, because of one and two, there's strong potential to integrate cover crops. Cover crops are not just for tying up fertilizer N following corn, but also they're beneficial for the end that's going to be leached regardless of what crop came before it. Okay, so that's an overview of what we had for the first two-year project. Now I want to segue into our new project, which is a five-year experiment. There's four field seasons here. This is a big undertaking for which we appreciate the support of ISA's checkoff funds. We're trying to, for the first time, comprehensively look at water quality, soil quality, and climate in Puts, sorry, uh, climate footprints, not inputs. And we want to look at these all together because oftentimes studies look at one or the other. There's a study on soil health and practices like no-till or cover crops. And it's hard to compare those apples to apples across different studies. So we decided to, in one place, in one fell swoop, to compare all three matrices at once. 
And these are three metrics that are increasingly of interest for things like carbon markets or environmental stewardship programs. So the goal of this work is to establish and then to integrate these three different benchmarks. And I use the word benchmarks here because we don't really have any basic numbers on, for example, um, how much can cover crops improve soil quality and water quality at the same time in different kinds of soybean production systems. And at the same time, what's the climate change footprint of that? So the rationale for this is that there's increasing discussion on all these different metrics, water quality, soil health testing is increasingly common by commercial labs, and then we've got carbon markets emerging. Uh, there's a need for basic fundamental data to guide decisions from policy to agricultural practices. So we've got four major goals here with four uh, deliverables that we anticipate within the next four years. First is uh, we want to give a tangible basis for soil health, both how it's managed and how we assess it. Soil health is subsiding from the Wild West of the last five years. There's a lot of indicators being proposed, and these are indicators that, that were initially developed in the Northeast. Why the Northeast? Because Cornell pushed the soil health initiative and that spread across the country but they developed certain measurements for the soil types of the northeast where i'm from and there are major crop exports largely rocks they're very rocky soils so we're talking sandy soils largely small scale ag we need to understand how those indicators are appropriate or not both in terms of what we measure and how we interpret the values for the context of the midwest so that's the first goal here this is also important because there's a lot of money being uh, thrown at this by the feds with USDA and RCS. So what are the best ways to monitor soil health in our systems and how do we interpret those values? And is it worth your money testing for certain indicators? They're not exactly cheap. Second goal is to uh, provide data that we think will position soybeans to be more competitive from our state. So there's increasing pressure or interest by certain uh, import countries like in the EU on what's the uh, sustainability footprints of your products, what's the water quality footprint, and especially climate change. So by providing this data, we can talk with hard values about the sustainability metrics to make uh, soybeans from our state a bit more competitive. Third, uh, we want to better understand, building on that two-year project that you saw, how soybeans can serve as a lever to decrease nitrate and phosphate losses from our state. Our state is the, is the first major contributor of phosphorus to the Mississippi Basin. We're number one, and we're number two for nitrate. But as I'd like to argue, soybeans offer a way to decrease both of those numbers. And fourth, we want to lay the foundation for helping producers and policymakers navigate the very murky waters of carbon markets. And I'll talk a bit more about this. To me, it's still rapidly emerging. A lot of proposed plans and uh, products for carbon markets and credits that are tough to understand. So we don't really have data, I would argue, for soybeans specifically and for cropping systems in our state that help producers make a decision on is an offer of 10 bucks per ton of carbon a good deal? What about 50? This product will deliver some data to help people understand whether those numbers are competitive. So let's talk about what we're gonna be measuring. So first of all, we start with productivity. This is the ultimate goal of agriculture, I believe, personally. Environmental impacts are secondary to providing fiber and food and fuel. And so because of that, we wanna then understand in the basis of productivity, how we've got soil health, water quality and climate change impacts nested around that. Again, we're gonna comprehensively look at all three. So this is in some sense a triple stacking of these different footprints or metrics. To do this, we've got three sites that roughly straddle north to south. Uh, so this is in Ewing and Franklin County, here in Champaign County on campus and up in Monmouth where we've got a little bit of a colder climate. So across these three sites, we're looking at uh, a very simple design. So this is not rocket science, but it's a good way to bound extremes of how we might manage soybean systems. Basically, it's going to be looking at conservation or no-till versus chisel till with or without cereal rye as a cover. This is not novel, but what is novel is how we assess the outcomes of these basic treatments. 
And we're looking at two crop rotations. So the central and south site will have a corn soybean and a corn double cropped wheat soybean crop rotation. Uh, not up north, I hear that it might be possible. If folks know of producers up north, up in Monmouth, doing double cropping wheat soybeans for all the years, and we'd like to work with them. But for now, we're going to focus on the double cropping in the central and south sites. And importantly, each year, every phase is going to be present so that we can account for weather differences in yields. So this leads over four years, um, 24 site years per crop rotation. It's um, a modest effort, but I think it will give us the basic data on these three different benchmarks. Okay, so let's talk about how we're gonna actually quantify and what are some considerations that are relevant to soybeans when it comes to these three different metrics that we want to benchmark. Let's begin with soil health. So soil health, I'm sure you've all heard about. It is the cooler word for soil quality, but arguably what defines soil health or makes it distinct from soil quality is the biology. At least that's one way to think about it. So that figure on the right-hand side is showing you uh, trends in the usage of these terms. This is coming out from Iowa State. You see that tilth was a big term, and tilth came about because of the Dust Bowl. Tilth connotes more of a physicality to soil quality. How well can it hold together? That then fell off, and soil quality made it an attempt in the 1980s, and it was displaced by, by soil health quite quickly. So soil health has really as its driver, as a concept, the biology. A lot of the indicators, which are simply a way of saying the measurements that define soil health or make it health, are biological in nature. Now, we've got questions about these, like which soil health indicators are relevant to crop production systems in north central U.S. and in our state specifically? And then what about central versus south of our state? And secondly, basic questions like when should we pull soils for testing for soil health? We've seen from our lab that if you sample soils and pre-plant in, say, April versus mid-season versus fall, you get completely different numbers on soil health indicators. Uh, so that's important to understand because if we want to standardize this to make it useful, that's an important consideration. All right, so to give you a flavor for the biology indicators that make soil health really health and less quality, uh, these are proposed indicators which are shared by NRCS, the feds, as well as the SHI, the Soil Health Institute. And uh, shown here in, in the red box are the uh, second tier, which just means the under evaluation indicators. The important thing is, as the arrows show you, a lot of these are metrics that are chasing biology. And we're not just talking things like microbiomass, but rather pools or um, fractions of nutrients that are cycling because of microbes. So things like enzymes that help catalyze and digest organic matter, like your enzymes in your stomach are digesting breakfast, in the same way soils are full of enzymes that digest organic matter. So in some sense, this is the metabolism of soil that we're trying to quantify. This is a concept diagram. It's meant to be complicated. Don't look too hard at it. The whole point here is that soil health indicators have not really been mechanistically integrated. That means that we don't understand how the indicators relate to each other in a way that's based on inherent processes. So for example, in the end pathway, as we decompose protein from crop residues, um, it, it gets transformed into amino acids by action of enzymes. And this should, in theory, supply N from organic matter. These indicators are different uh, insights to different steps along these pathways, just like in biochemistry, just like in medicine. So what we're trying to do in this project is to give a concrete foundation for how these different pathway steps can be assessed by these proposed indicators. So that I think will make them more tractable and easier to interpret in our uh, crop production systems. So that's soil health. In terms of water quality, our goal here is to understand the absolute and the, in the relative amounts of N and P leaching under these different uh, soybean-based crop rotations. And when I say absolute, I mean pounds of N, pounds of P per acre. And for relative, I mean the proportion of N or of P being lost under a different uh, crop phase of a rotation. So understanding the how much and the proportionality I think is important, they tell you different things. The way that we do this is um, we install lysimeters. These are basically ion traps that trap the ions of nitrate and phosphate as they work their way through the soil profile. And we put these right outside the rooting zone of soybeans where most of the roots kind of stop. And 
the argument here is that we could go deeper to get a more accurate leaching value, but to disturb the soil to get a neater deep bisimeter installation is quite drastic. So we opt for around 18 inch depth, more or less, to get a metric of leaching beyond the root zone. So it's a bit operational. And, and I want to now walk you through some examples of, of what we might expect and how we're thinking about uh, soybean base rotations and how they might decrease leaching in this project. So imagine the typical corn soybean uh, crop rotation shown here. See, we've got two pie charts. Uh, we've got the one on the top corresponds to the corn phase and then in year two for the soybean phase, we've got N and P leaching. Note the size of the circle is different. So a bigger pie is meaning more absolute values, more pounds per acre. And then the slices of N and P is the proportionality. So always two things going on, how much and the relative amount. So this is, this is a typical example of got a higher end proportionality for corn and more end because of the residual end. This is imaginary or an example. If we then have a cover crop following the soybean in front of corn, or it could also happen corn in front of soybean, we might anticipate, as we just saw, a decrease in the absolute amount and a slight shift in the proportionality perhaps. What if we then switch this to a corn, wheat, soybean double crop? Note that those pie graphs look the same, and that would be anticipated because wheat is basically acting like a cover crop in terms of, in terms of its ability to scavenge nitrogen. What if then we went one step further and had a cover crop uh, following the soybean, even if it were, say, interseeded in August? Now we've got the ideal scenario, water quality-wise, of roots in the ground year-round, and now note the smallest size here of the pie chart. So this is a theoretical walkthrough of how the treatments that we will be testing will give us numbers on these qualitative, what, what we might see. So this is not novel. We all anticipate changes in the sizes of these pie charts. What we wanna know is what's the actual amount and how is that different by things like tillage type and by soil types across the state. Finally, we're going to do a calculation, which is called the yield scale loss. Um, and this is basically a way that we can, in my opinion, better quantify and contextualize nutrient losses. So we have some of the most productive cropland, arguably the most productive in the world right here. And it's, I think, important to contextualize what we're losing with what we're producing. So this is the yield scale loss concept. And what you basically do is that you divide the pounds of N or pounds of P leached or loss by the bushels of grain produced. Some folks do it by the calories produced. This is important because some systems might produce less, but they might leach less. And so you might think that the lower leaching system is better for the environment, but arguably the one that produces uh, more crop for less leachate is the best metric. So this is why I think we have to contextualize. Now, there's been some work done here for corn. It's largely for nitrogen. To our knowledge, there's zero, zero studies that look at the yield loss, or sorry, the yield scale losses for soybean specifically. And that's anywhere in the world. So we plan to get those numbers. Um, and this has been talked about in some systems. Uh, there's a system by the UN that they tried to use to scale the impact of grain production systems. So what are we losing based on what we're producing? Here's a flavor for what this looks like. This is coming from that two-year project that we talked about earlier on, where we divided the, uh, the pounds of pea leached, in this case in central and south sites, by the bushels of soybean grain produced. Note the units, we're talking pounds of pea per bushel, and we're under overall you know, 0.5 pounds of pea per bushel or less, or sorry, 0.1 or less. So we're talking very small amounts. We're talking 60 pounds of grain and about an ounce of nutrient being leached. That's maybe hard to think about what does that mean because we don't really think of our losses as such, but I think this is gonna be an increasingly important metric for apples to apples comparisons across global cropping systems. Now at Ewing, we saw higher yield scale losses of phosphorus. They yielded less, but they lost the same amount of phosphorus, so we had a net higher yield scale loss. This is an example of how the system in Champaign is outperforming from a water quality perspective, the one in Franklin County, because it yielded a bit more for the same environmental impact of P losses. All right, so finally on to carbon credit markets. Uh, this is a wild west. I think Soul Health has cooled a little bit. It's a little bit more uh, 
evened out in terms of what's going on and what we should be doing about soil health. When it comes to carbon credits, though, this has arisen uh, yet again. It had a attempt at this back in the 2000s, at least from a soil science perspective. There was a lot of talk about sequestering carbon, and people thought that we jumped the gun back in the 1990s and early 2000s, and now it's come back. So uh, an example of this would be that there's lots of private sector enterprises like the ones on the left-hand side, Indigo or uh, Cortiva, trying to capitalize on carbon credits. And then we've got even the feds uh, injecting tremendous amounts of money. We're talking billions, almost $3 billion of federal monies being put into these climate smart commodity programs. This was a grant application that closed last year where the USDA was seeking projects between private and public sector to uh, facilitate the initiation of climate smart commodities, which basically means what's the carbon footprint of various agricultural products from livestock to grain crops like soybean. Now, the basic premise of this is that we're trying to reshuffle carbon from the atmosphere back into soils. And what we're trying to do uh, in these programs is in the crosshairs, reducing atmospheric CO2 concentrations. This is the goal. And the way that this is being proposed is that we can either increase carbon storage in the soil, which is shown here relative to other global storage pools, that little dot right there. And the circle, the second circle on the uh, top there is the exchange of gases, greenhouse gases from soil into the atmosphere. So in agriculture, we could potentially target atmospheric carbon reductions by increasing soil storage of carbon and by reducing the emissions of these greenhouse gases. This is the proposition. Very simple, it seems to work great on paper. As I'm sure lots of you know, it's a lot messier and complex in the real world. So a key then for any carbon credit marketplace is quantifying both the carbon stock sequestered and the greenhouse gas emissions. And that last part is very tricky. So the way that we approach this to measure carbon credits comprehensively is to measure both. We have to measure carbon stocks and the change in organic carbon stocks. I say organic because inorganic carbon, like carbonates, aren't really manageable with cover crops, for example. So first is quantifying the change in carbon stocks. This means going beyond six inches. If you see any carbon programs that sample the top six inches, I would run because they're missing the majority of the carbon stock that lies beneath the top six. So we have to go with hydraulic probes down to one meter depth. And second, to measure at weekly time scales greenhouse gas emissions. And we measure three greenhouse gases because of their CO2 equivalency. All that means is that in the case of methane, CH4, one unit of methane is like emitting 84 units of CO2. And for N2O, which might be a couple pounds of N per acre, agronomically, I don't think that that matters. Climate change wise, big impact because it's almost 300 times equivalency of CO2. So this is why we, we have to measure not just CO2 emissions, but also methane and N2O. Uh, because these emissions are very variable in time and space, it means going out there, rain, shine, or snow, and taking weekly gas measurements with very expensive instrumentation. But that's what it takes to get a true data-driven assessment of carbon credit potential for our state's cropping systems. So that's what we're going to be measuring in this project, uh, carbon stocks at the initiation and then at the end of the four-year project. Hopefully we could keep this going because, as you probably know, carbon stocks take some time to change. They change more at decadal time scale. And second, looking at greenhouse gases on a weekly scale for four years at 800 plots total across the state. What will we deliver with this project? So we want to, again, give these benchmark values on soil health, water quality, and climate footprints, as I've just explained. We don't have the data for that. And so if there's policies on any of these, or there's questions on do I invest funds for testing in soil health, et cetera, having good data would be, I think, important. Um, and what we hope to do is that this makes soybeans more competitive, and we can identify ways to have soybeans lead the way on things like nutrient loss reductions, which, as I've said at the beginning of this talk, soybeans didn't really enter the scene with a lot of grace when it came to water quality. So the first uh, thing that we plan to deliver is um, soil health information. Um, how much can, can we move the needle on soil health across these different cropping systems and practices? And importantly, what are the indicators that are useful for monitoring soil health in Illinois? So what is worth paying money for or not? 
Second, uh, what is the evidence um, or what are the data on these environmental metrics that some buyers of soybean in Europe, for example, are increasingly looking towards? Water quality and climate change footprints in particular. Um, and this goes hand in hand with, I think, a very distinct environmental metric that is now emerging, carbon credits. Is there a basis for anticipating carbon credits that are appreciable and can be capitalized on by farmers in our state? So important for this is how many tons of carbon can you sequester depending on soil type and depending on practices and depending on the cropping rotation. And fourth, uh, we want to understand the leverage points. Where are there relatively low pain, high output benefits for nutrient loss reductions with soybean? So for example, going back to the uh, opening example, um, soybeans can better deal with quote unquote cover cropping and uh, conservation tillage. What do those numbers look like? W what if we switch P sources to be TSP based? So um, with that, I want to wrap up the talk, but first before for going for questions, I wanted to take this opportunity to talk about a research project that ties into the carbon credit aspect of this ISA work. Um, I want to begin by giving or going back to this example of the Mara plots from 1876. Um, this is the legacy of our land grant. We are unique in that we host the second oldest continuous ag trial in the world. We also have the soils from this trial that were archived beginning in, in 1904. So my group is curating soils that were from the Mara plots that go back to 1904. And we also have a pedon collection. So a pedon collection simply refers to a full depth soil profile. In soil science, we call that a pedon. Ped Greek is, for, is, is the Greek word for foot, meaning ground. So basically, when the state was being mapped for its soils in 1899, beginning in Adams County, uh, some folks had the foresight to, to store these soils. So we know, going back to 1899, where these different three-foot deep soils were taken, which means that if we resample them, we're able to reconstruct changes in soils over centennial timescales, 120 plus years. And for reference, uh, this is a recent lit review that we did that shows how old are the oldest soils ever in the world. There's Rothamsted in the UK. The, the Brits were, you know, way... Uh, um, they were ahead in terms of storing soils, but our collection at U of I, both the Morrow plots and also the Pedon State Survey, is tied with the Brits for the oldest in the world. And we're well above the global average of 34 years or 40 years. We're looking at 120 year old soils. So um, this is what our collection looks like on the left. It's stored on the south farms. These are jars of soil and mason jars that are still intact going back to 1899. The oldest we found was 1862. So civil war is breaking out. We have those samples. And we also went to the USDA headquarters for a soil survey in Nebraska to repatriate soils from our state's collection, which means that now we have this coverage in space and time of these historical samples. So we've got soils that we know were taken in a given location as far back as 1904, 1920, uh, in terms of a thick population. By resampling this, then we get what's called a chrono sequence, a chronos Greek for time. So it's a time sequence. We get a timeline. Why do I bring this up? Well, this is a useful resource for us to understand as soil scientists, however soils which is the basis of agriculture in our state changed over a very long time period. This is unique folks. No one, not even the Brits have a resource that is a statewide one like this. So one specific question that we can answer that integrates directly with the ISA work that we're about to undertake would be carbon stocks. This gives us a long or a deep time understanding of carbon stock change over the last hundred plus years. Now, why am I saying all this? Uh, well, we need your help in relocating these sites, specifically access to sites. So this is a map, and I think that there's gonna be a link made public after this talk through ISA, which we much appreciate. These are the sites that we would like to resample. This is a link that you can follow. There's a sign-up sheet. If you're aware of uh, who farms that land or who owns it, and you know how we can access to take a sample again, we would appreciate that. We've identified where these soils have been taken, um, that's been a lot of work, two years of being in a freezing pole barn 24-7 for 12 months, not 24-7, but 12 months, trying to catalog them. So we've cataloged over 8,000 jars, one by one. We've made it 
um, into a online website that's going to go public in two years. The next step is to resample these soils. Uh, but we would need your help in knowing who owns that land and if they're willing to let us onto their land to take these deep cores. Small footprint, we're talking a Giddings probe, one inch in diameter. We'll do a couple of those and then we'll be on our way. So uh, if, you know, if you've got any thoughts, I'm happy to answer questions by email or just to talk about this. So I think there's five minutes for questions. Uh, if that's the case, I'm seeing nods, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Uh, so this was early on in your talk. You had, um, at, with the DAP application, you had like a 23 pounds of N an acre loss. Uh, what rate was that on? And is it, would it be oversimplifying to say instead of figuring 18%, you figure some other percentage as a rule of thumb on a DAP loss for N? Sure. So I can probably go back to that slide. Your question is about uh, the 23 pounds of N lost per acre from DAP. Uh, to clarify, the 18% refers to the end content of the DAP. I just want to make that. Okay, got it. Cool. Sure. So we put on, I believe there, it was uh, 60 pounds of P2O5 per acre for that at Urbana as DAP. And so then if you assume 18%, eight, uh, I got to do some math here, but... Uh, I don't know if you hate it. You hate. Do you recall the amount of nitrogen being applied as the DAP treatment? So roughly speaking, uh, what we found here is that the amount of N being applied as MAP or DAP more or less was matching with the magnitude being lost after you subtract the background leaching, which again, the background leaching exceeded the amount of N being lost from MAP or DAP. Uh, in one year, in one site, that's what we found. And there was one study done at the U of I by Dr. Fernandez back in, I think, 2014 or so. And he found that in a very wet and warm year, you lost two thirds of all of the fall applied MAP nitrogen. So in cold years, you only lose about a quarter, he found. So it's obviously it depends on the kind of winter and spring. But yeah, the evidence suggests that worst case, you're losing most, the majority of your fall applied end from MAP or DAP, which across all the acres of the state can really add up to be millions of pounds in a very warm and wet winter. All right. Thanks, everyone, for your time. Appreciate it.